Beautiful, good morning, everyone. We are two minutes early, just to be sure that everybody logs on, that the live streaming synchronizes with Facebook. If you can hear and see me and also see the presentation, please type in your chat that everything is okay. Let's use those two minutes for a technical chat, Te technical check. Everything is okay. While we're waiting for everybody else to log on, please do let me know where you're currently logging from. If you are in a country that differs from your nationality, let me know as well. I'm really curious to see. So I would then actually type Austrian in Lisbon. What about you guys? Where, where are you from? Where are you sitting? Where are you joining from? Okay, <laughs> French from France logging on, good. We have some people from Bucharest. German in Austria. What about um, people joining us from live streaming on Facebook? Please also let us know where are you currently joining us from? Okay, somebody sing on a farm east of Warsaw, great. Okay, so we have Austrians, Italy, Romania, Bulgarian from Vienna, Poland, Austrian from Lisbon. Okay, I also have from Facebook somebody joining from Copenhagen. Fantastic. Be Based in Poland. Good. Let's wait one more minute and we'll get started. Hungary. Joregeld. That's what I remember. Joregeld Mojor Orsak. I hope that made. Ah, okay, that did make sense. <laughs> At least to somebody. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. It's 10.01, so ready. <laughs> we're ready to get started. Um, welcome to our second module of our job search support webinars. Today, we will be discussing how to prepare CVs, uh, including CVs for applicant tracking systems, and how to optimize your LinkedIn profile. For those who don't know me, my name is Sandra Bichler. I founded Career Angels almost 10 years ago. It will be 10 years ago in June 2020. My background is executive search and marketing and sales. And when you combine the knowledge of how the job market works and how executive search works with what you know about sales and marketing, it, there's only one option left to go and use your know-how to help candidates navigate the job market. So I founded Career Angels in 2010. We have helped over 5,000 experienced managers and executives across Europe over the last couple of years. What you need to know about me and my team when it comes to this particular module is there are two things. One. We are a team of perfectionists, and when we recruit people into our team, we actually test for potential of eye for detail. So when we do work on CVs, it takes us approximately on average, let's say five to 10 hours, on average seven hours to prepare a CV because it goes through three proofreadings and quality controls, etc. So we take that part very, very seriously. And um, when working with uh, career angels, uh, you will always work with somebody who has been on the recruiter side, on the HR side, on the talent management side. So we make sure that anybody who works on documents knows what they're doing. Okay, um, about today, please do take notes. The presentation will not be made available. It will be interactive with exercises. And if you have any questions, please use the chat. 
that I'm monitoring and use if you're joining through live streaming on Facebook, use the comment section if you have questions. Good. Um, I have mentioned that already a big, at the beginning of uh, the first module, and I want to make sure I mention it here today with the most updated uh, market details so you know what is going on and what is changing on the, on the job market currently. So that has not changed uh, because of the coronavirus. We have gone overnight from an employee market to an employer market, which has certain consequences for candidates one of them being that it is, will be much more difficult to find a job because instead of competing against 200 or 1,000 co-candidates, co-competitors, you will be now in a talent pool of probably three to 5,000 per recruitment process. The moment we realized that the coronavirus and self isolation or quarantine would not be something temporary, but temporarily permanent. We immediately prepared a job search and career management guide that I recommend everybody to have a look at. And we are currently, and again, I checked in the morning, we're still the only career services uh, slash outplacement company that decided to offer part of their services for free. So all the other um, big players who do have the corporate funding and the money and the budgets, they don't feel the need to actually share and support the job market. We do, so we stepped up, and that's why we are doing those in total eight, 16 webinars, um, eight in English, eight in Polish. We started last week and will finish towards the end of June. So if you think that what we're doing is valuable, we have started a crowd crowdfunding and donations through PayPal. Everybody who has already donated, thank you very much. It's very much appreciated. Um, some chip in five euro. Um, today in the morning, we received a donation of 22 euro. Whatever the amount, everything helps. So immediate effects of the coronavirus. Let's see. The moment we realize this is something temporarily permanent, we started tracking 18 countries, 18 countries that are most important from our client's perspective. So uh, we tracked our most important markets. And we looked, the numbers that you see there, the 87,036 and 5,160, etc. This is the number of job ads on LinkedIn. So we decided to track since um, basically a month ago to see what happens with job ads on LinkedIn. And as you can see here, we have the first list in alphabetical order. Over the last four weeks, 737,832 job ads have disappeared from LinkedIn across 18 countries. Does that mean that almost a million jobs have disappeared? No, they have disappeared from LinkedIn. Of course, a big majority of those recruitment processes have actually been canceled. Some of them have been put on hold and some of them have moved to cheaper or more cost-effective local solutions. So that doesn't mean that it's a million jobs that have disappeared but it still is a good indication of what the trend is on the market. Um, the link LinkedIn as a portal is a, an expensive job portal. So that also shows that even if part of them have been taken off to move to local, um, local alternatives, it does show that companies are very cost aware currently. Now, Let's look at the same um, same 18 countries sorted by percentages. In week 16, in we are right now in week 17. So week 17 started yesterday. Um, two weeks ago, we decided to extend the 18 countries to 36 countries in Europe. 
Um, here you have the numbers in alphabetical order. Let me show you the same sorted. So from last week to this week, we have an increase in job ads in Ireland, for example, plus 14%. And it goes down to Moldova minus 28%, which is within one week. If we look at a two week period, so from two weeks ago until yesterday, we have half a million job ads disappearing from LinkedIn in 36 countries. That's minus 11.14%. And in percentage, um, probably Andorra is not the best country to um well use as an as an example for the rest of europe but you can see over two week periods um in percent we're down minus 11.14 and switzerland minus four percent austria minus five percent etc etc and here actually now that i think of it especially when you look at switzerland austria greece etc um those are the countries that do support companies, employees, et cetera. Those governments have instruments to protect the job market a bit longer. So you can see that here the effects take longer to kick in. And uh, countries where there's not that much support, you have the drops, the drops in job ads on LinkedIn are much more significant. Okay. That takes us to what do you do now, um, especially if you have to look for a job and not only looking for a plan B. As discussed in the first module, the job search strategy goes across four steps. The first step is to define what it is that you're looking for. Once you know that, you look at your unique selling proposition. So how do you brand position yourself on the job market? And we discussed it in module one. And you can already go on our YouTube channel and watch the recording if you missed it. Today, we will look at how to prepare the two different types of CVs and how to optimize your LinkedIn profile. And um, the fourth step is to use all four job search channels, which we will discuss next week. And online interviews will happen in module four. Now, the CV. And here, I would like to ask you a question that might seem obvious or ridiculous, not to use the word stupid, but I do want to ask you, what is the goal of the CV? How would you define the role and goal of a CV? If you could please share that in the chat. And I'll say there are no wrong answers. I'm interested to see how you perceive the goal and the role of a CV. And I can see already a couple of people typing. OK, show you capabilities, reflect core competencies and achievements. Five more people are typing. Candidate presentation in their absence to show qualifications to be invited to an interview. Get a job interview. To be invited for a job interview. Present ourselves as close to the requirements as possible, which means an adjustment for CV for each position. Okay, two more people, three more people typing selling a bit of selling your myself advertise yourself get a job okay now from our perspective the goal of the cv is to get an interview not the job N at least not right away so here when we look at the whole application process you can think of it like a video game where you have to unlock levels. In other words, the subject line in the email when you send a C when you send your CV by email and you have the subject line. So the subject line, the goal of the subject line is for the reader to click on the email instead of deleting it. The goal of the cover email 
is for the person to click on your CV and not delete it. Because from a recruiter's perspective, they always have read or delete. Very, very clear. The goal of the CV is to receive a screening call. The goal, uh, the screening call is if somebody likes our CV and they see there is potential in our candidacy, that means you get a phone call that's usually anywhere between five and 15 minutes, which is already an interview, but we call it a screening call. And the goal of the screening call is to say, I want to invite that person to a proper interview. And the goal of the first interview is to invite it, to be invited to a second interview. And the goal of the second interview is then to get a job offer. So this is like, uh, actually, this is more or less like dating. You wouldn't go into a bar, see somebody that you like, walk up to them and say, listen, what do you think about getting married? You also first talk to somebody, have a first date, have a second date. You wouldn't go to a first date with a prenup, right? So here as well in the application process, we take it one step at a time, like in a video game, we unlock levels step by step. So the rules when writing your CV, it has to be written for the audience in mind. Remember in the first module, we talked about how important it is to define your targets, to define your goal. That goal is then translated into the types of companies that you want to apply to and the types of industries. And depending on who your potential boss is, what your potential industry is, the CV will look differently. In other words, there is a difference between selling um, chocolate to vegans and chocolate to chocolate lovers and chocolate to people who are lactose intolerant etc etc so every audience needs a different message what's super important is to remember that this is a document that does not tolerate mistakes to put that a little bit into context um, one of the most important things to remember and if that's the only thing that you will take away from today then that should be it the recruiters role or the hiring manager's role is when they have hundreds of candidates and they go through the candidacies and through the documents and through all those professionals their intention is when reviewing your applications is not to find reasons to keep you in the recruitment process but they look for reasons to exclude you from the recruitment process and sometimes those filters may seem very arbitrary you will find recruiters who will say bad cv bad candidate is that true no it just means they're bad cv writers but that doesn't influence their competencies as a manager but you need to apply some filters so some say if there are spelling mistakes in the cv that candidate doesn't take um, their career and job search Seriously, delete. Oh, there's no photo, delete. Oh, there is a photo, there shouldn't be a photo, delete. So we prepare CVs and we operate under the assumption of the worst case scenario, meaning on the other side of the screen is somebody who, who has set their bar, their selection bar very, very high. Plus, and that is something else, especially when it comes to spelling mistakes, the applicant tracking systems don't understand spelling mistakes. Um, one of the things that are misspelled most often in CVs or in English is the word professional, career, business, and experience. And the applicant tracking system, if the word doesn't match words from the dictionary, they simply will filter you out and that's not what you want. And also important, depending on the job hunting channel that you are going through, we need to ask ourselves the question, who is the recipient of my CV? It is, a, is it a human or is it an applicant tracking system slash artificial intelligence or let's say machine learning? 
And what we also discussed last time, what we need to remember, part of the interview happens already on the screen. There are a lot of candidates who say, yeah, yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell that during the interview. The thing is, if you don't include it in the CV, you might not get the chance to tell your story or describe your successes in an actual one-on-one -on -one interaction. So let's look at the four channels and decide together what, who the recipient is, if it's human or bot. So one speculative introduction is the job hunting channel where you contact your potential boss directly at 75 to 90 pre-selected companies. Question to everybody online today, who is the recipient of your CV, human or bot? Exactly, thank you for playing, Andre. <laughs> um, when we network, when we send a CV to friends and family and current and former colleagues, human or bot? Okay, very good. What about executive search firms, human or bot? Reaching out to headhunters. Exactly, it depends, it can be either or. Um, human unless you upload it to a database. So it depends on both is correct. What about job ads when applying to job ads, let's say through LinkedIn or other portals? Mm -hmm. Applicant tracking systems, both. Okay, here the correct answer is also both or it depends. Uh, definitely the direction it is going to is applicant tracking system, especially with the big corporations. And I'll show you later how the statistics look like. Okay. Now, when we look at a day of a recruiter, before the pandemic, a, the average recruiter would receive 50 unsolicited CVs per day. Unsolicited means CVs they have not asked for. That is 250 CVs per week, 1,000 CVs per month, 12,000 CVs per year. On top of that, a recruiter has usually 5 to 15 ongoing parallel recruitment projects. Every recruitment project is another 20 to 50 CVs of solicited CVs plus Recruiters have a lot of KPIs if they work in a KPI-driven recruitment firm. KPIs would include five business development calls per day, three client meetings per day. So not only do they have to deliver recruitment pro projects, they also have to deliver sales targets. So this is a really high pressure, tough job. Now, this was before what happened now, and we've been in touch, my team and I, we have been in touch with recruiters over the last weeks. Right now, this is still manageable, but right now recruiters are flooded with CVs. So the quality of CVs is even more important to positively stand out. Now I'd like to show you some examples. Important, the examples that you'll see, the email addresses, the names, the telephone numbers, everything is made up, but they are based on real examples. And um, if you can take notes of what you see, in total, we will go through 10 examples. And after those, those 10 bad examples, I will show you five good examples. And if we manage, I want you to try to match the good example with the bad example, because here we'll have before and after situations, okay? And what I'll also do in the first um, three CVs, I will share why they are bad and what I see. And in the remaining, I'd like to have a discussion and I wanna see what you see, because it is important to be on the same page when it comes to quality, to be able to, do, to discuss it further. So example number one. 
I don't even know where I should get started. This is a very traditional CV. Um, without having to read that the nationality is French, I already know that this is a French CV because French, the French markets, one of the things they do is they write their last name in all caps. So I don't need to see that this is a French nationality CV because I can tell it by how um, the last name Smith is written. Now, if this is a French person looking for a job in France, perfect. But if this is a French person looking for a job outside of France, not good, especially that we have it inverse. So it should actually say Barbara Smith and Smith written normally. Um, age 43 is obviously a big no-go. This is completely irrelevant. Now, for those sitting in traditional job markets, especially Austria, Germany, recruiters who have been brought up in the 90, 90s will insist and they will tell you, listen, your date of birth must be on the CV. The overall international trend, especially in Europe, is to exclude any piece of information that could be basis for discrimination. So what is already standard in the United States is a trend in Europe. And the, the interesting thing is because one of the things Things, and this is a part, this is a core part of our methodology. We track everything in, term, in, in terms of reactions and response. Now, one of the KPIs that we track is the response rate. In other words, if a candidate contacts 100 decision makers, how many will respond? And the response rate, the traditional good response rate that we receive is 30 to 50%. Now we tested it and we tested CVs with or without date of birth. Even though recruiters in Germany and Austria scream about, oh, but your CV is all wrong. You don't have a birth date, a birth date on your CV. Even if it's not on there, the response rate is still 30 to 50%. Um, if somebody super insists, okay, but then don't have it in the header as the most important information, but move it at the very end to the additional information section, for example. Okay, what else is wrong with this CV? Um, marital status, not relevant. How many kids you have is completely irrelevant. Starting if you are a... Well, it doesn't actually matter unless you're a student or a recent graduate, let's put it that way. Your CV definitely should not start with education. Languages and IT, especially here, for example, the section is called languages and IT, but I don't have IT there, for example. Uh, one other thing, and this is a very common mistake, um, you assume even if the nationality weren't French, doesn't mean that every national speaks French to start with. So in the language section, and that also applies to LinkedIn, include your own, the native language. A lot of people forget about that because they assume it's obvious, but especially if the CV goes out to somebody outside your own country, it's not obvious for the reader. They might not know that, um, Edita is a Polish name. Could edit Edita could also be, I don't know, German, for example. Good. Let's look at the next bad example. Um, here we have John Smith. I don't, again, don't know where to start. One, you can see it's all scrambled up. So that already tells me this person sent their CV in an open document, not in PDF. LinkedIn, please open this link to the profile. 
if you have a personalized link, you don't have to, it, you can actually have a link, you can hyperlink the logo. There's so many ways to go about that. Um, then we have a profile summary, which from, I mean, the structure here is much better. We have a header, which takes up a lot of space. And then in the profile, experience manager, dynamic, leadership, multinational, but this is very generic, blah, blah. When you look at profile summaries on LinkedIn, you will see that the most used words are experienced, motivated, team player. This describes a lot of people. There is nothing unique about this profile summary. And then key skills. And usually here again, a common mistake to have within the key skills, 20 key skills or 30, the, no. So next one. Here again, this is an example of a Word document gone wrong. Um, we should have received that file definitely in a PDF, but aside from the graphics that got all scrambled up, you can see this CV has two columns. So I don't know where to start. Should I read the profile? Should I read the skills and sector? Plus it starts again, we have right there education, solid experience working in communication, 50 years of experience, international profile. What does international mean? Um, international is one of those very enigmatic words. People describe that they have international experience when they, work for an international corporation, but have never lived and worked outside their own country because international is enough if it's, for example, a headquarters role. Um, international could mean two countries. International could mean 20 countries. So the word international is very enigmatic. Unless there is a purpose behind that word, it's better to define it as well. Skills and sectors. So it's a big mess, as you can see. Okay, now, question to you. What's wrong with this CV? And let's see what you would see and just type up everything you see that, that is wrong. Okay, why the layout, Anna? Marriage status, I agree, shouldn't be here. Age shouldn't be here. Um, Age, merit, personal information comes first. Mm -hmm. Poor formatting, there should be more. Okay, it should be divided up. Mm -hmm. Hard to read. Too much space among paragraphs. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so there is uh, time where there's space wasted when it comes to nationality. Um, it the nationality only makes sense again. Remember, this, these have been those are blinded CVs. So, here, for example, that would Austrian is obvious that they have EU work permits. But let's assume if that were Australian nationality or the, the nationality sometimes gives us a hint in terms of the work permit information, but definitely um, shouldn't be there. It's better to say EU work permit, for example. Um, Andre, that's a very good point. It starts with the goal and not with the unique selling proposition. Question where should the career goal be included? Some of you are typing. Let's see if you have the answer in the cover letter. Exactly. So the career goal, and here you will find about 5% of the recruiters who will disagree with me and who will actually insist that the career goal has to be part of the CV. The other 95% of the recruiters will say, please do not include your career goal in the CV. 
definitely add it in the email that you send out especially if it if you are a rather versatile candidate once this is uploaded in in a database in with a headhunter a your career goal can change within a year or two and two if you have a broad profile and um, here it says direct the head of product management or head of engineering role in IT and um, the person has the, the recruiter has a job for business unit manager but it says head of product no not relevant um, here there's a question if he was applying in Austria would it make sense to include EU work permit yes definitely um, so I agree with what you said. Um, the beginning again takes up too much uh, space and there is irrelevant information. The career goal should not be included. Um, it does have a profile then. My key strength is an excellent business acum acumen, etc. Technologies. I actually like the fact that it defines what kind of technologies because those are keywords that can be matched against ongoing recruitment processes. However, it is not unique. So this is definitely something that can be worked on. Okay, next bad CV. Um, so here we have a nice header that doesn't take up much space and the gray, um, the gray box, that's where the photo was. So what, how do we like this beginning? Okay, divorced. <laughs> Personal data again, photo. The photo isn't missing. Um, we, instead of the photo, we put uh, to blind the CV. Okay, good. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Too much space taken. Okay. Now, one thing when somebody opens your cv automatically on the screen they will see the first half page of your first page of the cv now when you look at the previous cvs and this one do you see at first sight what role this person is good for no exactly um let's go back here at first sight i would say could be an engineer here at first sight acca mba msc probably accountant here i have probably something with communication but i don't know what level here the thing is because the profiles are nothing is bolded. I see James Adams, career goal, senior product manager for IT. So probably something in IT. Here, I have no idea. And now the job of recruiters and hiring managers and HR people is already tough, especially if they have KPIs. Now, if they can't see within a couple of seconds what box to put you in, what recruitment process you qualify for, they don't have time to read three, four, five pages to say, hmm, David Williams, let's see what he has to offer. I'll give him a call because his CV is not clear. So let's talk about his potential and his competencies. And of course, it would be great if that were possible, but it's not. So the first half page of your CV is absolutely key. So here you can see there's so much irrelevant information in the first half page. Okay, this is another example of why it's not a good idea to send um, CVs in a uh, open file um why it would be much better to send it in a pdf and here again this person says they um specialize in customer experience 
me as the recruiter, I'm also a customer and my customer experience here is very bad. So um, definitely send out your CV in PDFs now. Some, sometimes we hear this argument, okay, but if I send a PDF, the recruiter will come back and say, please send it to me in open format. Once you have made, and that's okay, once you have made a good impression through the PDF, it doesn't matter if the document later on in a .doc or .x version is scrambled up, that's fine, because you've already made a good impression in the PDF format. Um, good. Um, here, aside from the layout, what else don't we like about what's missing here? Why is this not a good CV? Um, here, a question would you in general recommend to include a photo in the CV or not? And if yes, we're in the document, we'll talk about photos in a bit. I have dedicated photo slides. Okay, so what is it? What don't we like about? um about the cv aside from the layout and the fact that it's scrambled up okay most important thing there's no profile section and uh, that's the most important bit so from a structure point of view i do have a header i don't have the profile summary and it's yeah plus um because i already have two entries here that i can see on the left meaning I already see how the person described their experience, their professional experience. Now, this person has been working for the company for by now would be five years. And I have only three bullet points describing five years of experience within the company. Where the successes, where the projects, where the tangible results. I don't have that. So this is also, that is definitely missing. Um, yeah, definitely missing. So when you prepare a CV, aside from the responsibilities, make sure you have a section called selected successes, selected achievements, selected projects, projects and achievement, however you wanna call it. And make sure you have three to five most important and most relevant successes from the reader's point of view. Okay, next. What about this one? Yes or no? I um, see your question, and I'll we'll discuss it when um, when we'll talk about ATS. Okay, so what's wrong with this? Eight, uh, two big letters, definitely not clear layout. Yes, looks messy, yes. Two columns, two big letters. It's two columns, where do you start? Wasting too much space, absolutely yes. The only thing I know that this person is HR and finance in Africa and Europe. That's the only thing I know, which I mean, it is a box, um, but the rest is not clear. So I don't know what their unique selling proposition is. Yeah, very large box. Yeah, exactly, it's a very large box. So this is a trend that is happening on the job market, definitely. When you look at CV templates and more and more people use CV templates, please don't. A lot of those templates recommend and go through two column, uh, two column CVs, sometimes even three column CVs a human being and even worse an applicant tracking system they cannot read it you don't know where to look at do you look at the left do you look at the right get distracted by the contact details in a one column cv so a traditional format you have a clear hierarchy of information what is most important what is least important and you can direct the eye of the reader towards what you want them to read so please do not use two column CVs. It doesn't work. Um, what else is missing here first? Yeah, I mean, you said it all. You don't really know where to start. Um, the profile is very generic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. 
What's wrong with CV number eight? Aside from the fact that it's all scrambled up, so we know it was not sent in the PDF. Formatting is all wrong, yes. I wouldn't mind the colors, but not the way it's done here. It's a too generic summary, blah, blah, in the profile, exactly. For example, high school education shouldn't be there. Email, and you can say in parentheses, it says it's a private email. We have the date of birth that is not needed, correct. Marital status, no. Um, what if the idea of a two column CV is to maximize space? Should it be discouraged either way? Definitely discouraged. Plus, um, we've actually researched the two column CVs um, to, um, we had to find arguments. One of our clients fell in love with the idea of um, two column CVs and he rejected all our one column CV ideas. So we actually went out to even find more data to dissuade him from from the two column CVs. And it turns out there was a company that uh, spent some time on research. And although you feel that you can cram more information on two uh, column CV, you actually lose about 15% of the space. Okay, we have different fonts. This just, yeah, this doesn't work. Okay, if anybody ever has this idea to put their work email address on the CV, please don't do it. If you have your own company or your own domain or something that might look like a, an official, like a business email, make sure you have a private one, Gmail, make sure it is a professional looking email address. And if Gmail has run out of your um, first name, last name combination, you can try Ymail, this is Yahoo. I'm typing that on the chat. Ymail is they there are still a lot of open um, combinations. So, because again, those are little signals here and there that tell us is this person, let's put it differently. This could be one of the filters for a recruiter to say, nah, that they don't care about the personal branding they use. Um, I had a client, I will never forget uh, his email address. He was a very competent CFO um, and he had been using his private email address since the early 90s. I will not share what kind of email address um, I had in the 90s, but his was Teddy Bear 66. So, no, uh, please don't. Don't have any letters in your email address. No 007007 something. Just please don't. Um, if you want to keep it within Gmail because your other email addresses are on Gmail, a tip. Um, use the initial of your second name. So let's say John Kowalski is taken on Gmail, then go for John F. Kowalski, John M. Kowalski, etc. That usually works quite well. Okay, next. What about the CV? What don't we like about this version? There is no summary, correct? We don't really know. I mean, the assumption could be market entry consultant. Exactly. I don't know the box. I don't know the unique selling proposition. One thing that is recommended when you have, um, let's say you change jobs within the same company. Here, our recommendation is very often to batch those into one entry. So from the first perspective, to not make this person, to not give the perception of, oh, this person changes jobs every two years. Oh, high risk candidate, oh, delete. I mean, here it's not an issue because it's four years, then it's two years. But if you actually then start reading, oh, this has been, so this person hasn't been two years in 
this current role, but it's actually six years. So it's um, sometimes a good idea to batch those into one. Um, but if you want to highlight the promotions, you can highlight the promotions when, when batching because then you see junior market entry specialist and then senior market entry specialist and then market uh, entry consultant and senior consultant. So you actually show it within the batching. And if I remember correctly, you will see an example in a bit of how that can work visually. Okay. And then the last bad CV which at first sight doesn't look that bad. We have a header, we have a photo in the header, we have the most important contact details. It does take a bit too much space, but what about the rest? Do we like it, yes or no? Let's see. One person is typing sharing their opinion. Three people are typing. Four people are typing. Now I'm very curious to see what you've come, what you come up with. The gray area with basic information is to be correct. The large contact detail section, correct. Repeated information. Um, yeah. So, and there are again, a lot of generic words. Uh, we have a question from Facebook. What about year of birth in the email? It should not even be birth date, age, marital status, anything that can be a basis of discrimination should not be anywhere in the application process. So not in the email, not in the CV, not in the LinkedIn profile, etc. Okay. So this is already quite good, but it can be better. This one uh, talking about the profile summary, it does start with a profile summary, but it's not that unique. Plus, one thing you also have to remember, when people look at text on the screen, the eye on the screen doesn't read like it would in a magazine that you actually read. It scans information. And here, because it's a light gray um, font, color. The only thing that is here highlighted is experienced. But then I actually have to come close and focus and try to figure out what this is about. So aside from generic, non-generic, what would make sense here is to bold keywords, which is very important when sending your CV to humans. ATS don't care. OK, good. Here we have uh, Barbara Smith, who you might remember. And this is, um, now I realize why this um, exercise can't work because Barbara Smith, you all remember that was the first TV. Uh, so A and one would be the same. Now let me show you the before and after. And that's the same candidate. Here we know that this is somebody general manager with a sales background in construction. I immediately know where to put that person into. I know the caliber of the candidates. I know how many people they have managed. I know their backgrounds. It's crystal clear from a recruiter's perspective, uh, hiring, when I say recruiter and again, Recruiter means internal, external, hiring manager, decision maker, anybody who recruits somebody into their team or into their client's team. I know the box. I understand the caliber. I understand what language skills, what's the geogra geography. Everything's clear to me at once at the first sight. Do, do you remember John Smith? Let's show you before and after. So instead of me having to deduce ACCA, MBA, MSc, okay, probably accountant. Actually, it's not an accountant. It's a finance manager, international, Greece, Turkey, Albania, uh, tariffs, investments, 
innovation. Oh, it's an innovative manager. And I have the language skills. Some, some people would criticize and say, but there's still a, too much text. It's the most, the text that is relevant is bolded. So again, the eye doesn't read it, it scans the information and the most important information is there. Um, as a, okay. <laughs> Uh, good, I answered your uh, question, Damien. So here you will also see, um, in theory, we could have left only in the profile summary, drag it a bit more out and say, this is a finance manager, have a little bit more space and not include information about experience with an innovation element. We could have taken that out. And then the profile summary, we could have what uh, Damien just said, have it more space there, not so confined. Now, that person applied to a company where innovation was very important. And here, instead of saying innovative finance manager, because again, we said every anybody can call themselves experienced, innovative, creative, etc but only what you can prove actually exists is, is good. So if it is something, if for example, innovation is something unique about you, then make sure to say innovation and give proof of that um, capability of yours. Um, in German uh, or Germ in the German speaking job market, uh, people are obsessed with titles, MBAs, etc. Here, my comment is of obviously you need to adapt your CV to the target audience. So, if the title is important, add it to the CV. If it's not important, don't add it. If you're not sure, add it as part of the profile summary. Sometimes, um, I now have a client whose PhD is a problem on the job market because he might be seen as a competitor by his potential bosses. Some will appreciate it, some won't. So here um, we decided to not say PhD doctor something, but have the information in the, and the, leave the information in the, in the educational part on the second or third page. And if somebody finds it, they will appreciate it. If it's not important, they won't even realize that he has a PhD. So titles is a tricky one in terms of always having to remember who you're sending the, the documents to. Next, remember that person. Let's look at before and after. And completely different CV. At first sight, I see, oh, this is international. I have the countries there. I know much more about the person. And here we have it batched. Um, so we have the company and then how, how the person advanced within one company. Okay. One more. Remember Jessica Jones. I'll show you before and after. So um, we didn't have the before version now that I realize. Um, sales manager, I'll go back so actually we can uh, look at this a bit more closely. Sales manager and in sales, what's important is, is the results. And I can start with them right away. There's a lot of tangible things that you can show as a sales manager, retail, you can um, describe the channels, you uh, can manage uh, if you've launched something, um, how much you've increased sales on what kind of markets, your language skills, the budgets, the team size, etc. So at first size, I already know, sales, probably expert, something, something. So I know the box. I have the most important contact details, and that's about it. And you can also see here, um, 
you we have the professional experience we have um the um, um title at company and then at the very bottom you see selected achievements which is a must is it acceptable working in english instead of specifying native language absolutely yes works in english and german um it is again especially and that's something that came from the united states you should not indicate your native language because it could be a basis for discrimination so the the trend again is to say it works for example proficiently or proficient in english and german um etc so absolutely okay now if you are in a country where the local language is important make sure to make a point of at first sight showing for example here intensively learning french or intensively learning german those are markets the french and the german speaking ones that really prefer or appreciate if somebody knows the language um, and intensively learning install duolingo right away and do half an hour of duolingo every day that's already a start of um, intensively learning it. Again, you should not lie. If you are not studying, if you're not learning it, don't add it. Okay. Well, maybe here also one more comment. Up until a couple of months ago, candidates, because it was a candidate market, some of the candidates would say, I will learn the language once the company hires me that will not fly anymore so you need to make sure if the language skills are a differentiator or potential filter to filter you out make sure you first learn the language or are already intensively learning to demonstrate hey i'm motivated you don't have to give me a job for me to start learning it okay next let me show you so here again, I see at first sight, PL, sales, marketing, people. I see French and English. And so I know which box. I don't even have to go into detail. At first sight, I know the box. And if I then pay a bit more uh, attention, I see the caliber. Um, here we had to blind the CV a bit more and add a lot of, lot of Ipsum text. But this is the before and after. This is the same candidate. Um, we once did an experiment without, well, actually a client of ours did an experiment for us unintentionally. She was an HR director in the banking industry. Um, sent her CV to a recruiter, the recruiter forwarded to forwarded um, her CV to the CEO of the bank, said, I'm not interested. We read it the CV so that at first time it was clear what, what, was, what was unique about her profile. The, um, our client listened to us. She resent the CV to the recruiter saying, I know we've been in touch two weeks ago, but I wanted to sure I wanted to make sure that you have my most updated CV version. The recruiter again clicked forward, sent um, the CV to the same CEO, and the CEO called immediately saying, "Why didn't? Why haven't you presented this candidate before to me?" Same person. So you can also see here it's the same person, it's the same candidate, it's the same competencies, it's the same person. But one is generic and the other one shows me exactly what they can offer, what they bring to the table, what potential added value they have for my business, for my client's business, etc. Okay, so summarizing most important points. The structure, we have Heather with contact details, we have a unique profile summary. If you don't know if your profile summary is unique enough, do the LinkedIn test. Meaning, if somebody on LinkedIn, if somebody with a similar profile profession position were to read your profile summary on LinkedIn and could say, oh, 
this is a really good profile summary. I will copy paste it and use it as my own. And I'll just exchange instead of 15 years of experience, I'll say 20 years of experience. So if they, by exchanging two of the, no or two or three little details here and there, they can copy paste it. It means your profile summary is generic. We do not like and we do not want generic. Then we go over to experience. Depending on what is more important, you either highlight visually the company or the position. And you make sure that you have and express tangible results, projects for the last seven years or three roles, depending on how it um, shapes up. Then you have education and then you have additional information. Any questions to that? I will soon move to the applicant tracking system, CV version and to LinkedIn profile. So if you have any questions about CVs, this is now the moment to get them off your chest. Um, Elina says, could you please show moving from one position to another visually? I don't have it in the presentation. Um, I will, what I can do, I can send you an example um, after the webinar. Elina, and I'll make sure everybody gets that example who was online today. Um, batching and moving up, batching and moving up and i'll make sure the polish uh webinar in two days will already have that on the slides okay we'll do that um what are your thoughts on leaving impression what are your thoughts on leaving the impression of being overqualified um richard can you be a little bit more specific I'm not sure I understand your question. Any other CV questions other than photo? We will discuss photos in a bit. Please ask them now. I was expecting a question about should I include hobbies? Yes or no? Um, I pretend uh, I got that question. So with hobbies or interests, Add them if they are unique. So if it says reading, uh, traveling, and dancing, no. Unless it is really something that you do passionately and you do currently. And then, for example, dancing and then in parentheses, twice a week salsa classes or something like that. Um, and if the interests are relevant for the target group, for the industry, for your position, then you can obviously also include them. If you don't have space, not that important. Um, Yanni's question, if you don't use a template, how do you make it look visually appealing? For example, header in color. You choose a color that you can identify with that is not too screaming. That would be the word, a color that is not um, too strong. Um, and you simply choose a color that fits you, your personality, um, or you choose a color that is already part of your photo. So you have a color scheme in the whole um, document. Okay. Can it be done in Word, just shading the header? Uh, absolutely, yes, Yanni can absolutely be done. All our CVs are, uh, we prepare the CVs in LibreOffice, um, which is an open source word processor. Um, yeah. So I can highly recommend everybody and everything is possible in almost everything is possible without having to be a graphic designer. Okay. Now, when you look at your CV, my recommendation is to challenge when you start working on your CV, challenge 
every sentence and every piece of information that is currently on your CV. One thing is what type of information is relevant. Let's say you have 25 years of experience and the first five years had nothing to do with what you're currently applying to, either don't even include it or make sure it's very short. So if it's not relevant, don't add it to the CV. Um, maybe there are things that are obvious that don't need to be in the CV or there are things that are not obvious that should be further explained. Um, that happens with candidates who have been in one company for a long time because they're so used to their company lingo that they forget to explain it to the outside world. To give an example, I had a client who said that his role, he was responsible for the CEE region and didn't define or explain what CEE meant. One of the things we do is we ask every about everything and it turns out CEE in his company, what was super obvious for him was 34 countries, CEE region. For other CE, sometimes it means three countries, and there is a big difference between three and 34 countries. Also shows a completely different caliber. So you challenge the content. What is relevant? What is obvious? What isn't obvious? What's not concrete enough? Or on the other hand, what is too much detail? Very often the how you got some work can be explained during an interview. So or giving context can explain in the interview. So results important, but how you got there in too much detail can be too much detail because it should be left for the actual interview stage. Okay, uh, graphics and layout. In terms of length, the standard is one to three pages. Um, for anybody who has more than 10 years of experience, two to three pages even in the United States. This is something that is slowly changes, changing and where more and more people say it doesn't make sense to squeeze everything into one page because they have discovered a unique profile summary, et cetera, et cetera. Um, photo, it depends. Let's start with the easiest part here, United States, no photo basis for discrimination, CV must not be processed and will be deleted immediately. In the UK, in theory, not allowed, but not really also a matter for exclusion. Um, photo, yes or no? It, this is a tough one. And our thinking is very practical. If it helps you, add it. If it doesn't help you, don't add it. So we don't have a rule here to say if it's in Germany, add it. If it's in Austria, don't add it. If it's in Italy, something. No. We take it really case by case. If it's a good quality photo and it helps your personal branding, why not? Um, we sometimes have clients who have more than 15 or 20 years of experience, but on the photo, they look like teenagers or 20 something year old. Well, that for a woman on a dating profile would be very nice. It doesn't help on a professional application. So here we are really very practical and take it really case by case. Uh, one thing when experiments, we also ran without intention, that was a long time ago. Um, we had a client uh, marketing manager who was very photogenic. And it so happened that she applied to marketing directors who were in big majority female. The response rate to the CV with the photo was below our average. It was not 30 to 50%, it was closer to about 20%. Um, we then tried the same CV without the photo, without this very beautiful photogenic lady on the, on, on the CV, 
and all of a sudden she had 30 to 50 percent uh, response rate still so if beautiful woman applies to beautiful woman doesn't really work so photo it depends if it helps you add it if it doesn't help you don't add it this is what i would say th the rule could be and then if you have a good photo use the colors of the photo so if your background if for example you are wearing a nice um blue jacket or a blouse you can use that color to then have titles in dark blue and the text color could be um, gray etc so you can actually have a whole branding around the photo you can have business cards that are done based on that um, so there's lots of things you can do with that on the cv one two three colors um and i should actually say two colors what a third color is a variation of one of the first two colors um one to two font types not more and here the font differences could be uh sans serif for the text and serif for the titles for example it's about legibility and um adding for example if you have a nice very often the nice elegant fonts look good on the titles but then make the text illegible so you can have an elegant if you yourself are a very elegant high caliber candidate you can have a nice font an elegant font as a title but then stick to a legible standard font in in the rest of the cv here's a question what about adding certificates as attachment to the cv absolute no that would be going to your first date with a prenup first generate the interest if they want certificates then they will ask for it but this would be too much um, for a first contact and definitely we've discussed it at length one column cvs colors and fonts um, keep it simple and professional it is an opportunity to positively stand out and it adds personality and energy to the whole piece of paper on screen um question are there no goes for photos okay getting there graphics with photos so if you decide to to, to use a photo please use a good quality photo neutral background so please don't use any photos from outside in the park with trees and bushes behind you and dress as if you were to go to an important interview. So that partly answers um, the chat question. Uh, are the no-goes like beards for men? If that man would go like that to an interview, be my guest because it's authentic. That's who that person is. Um, but overall, it sh you should look on the photo like, the way they will see you during the first interview. And here again, um, the question sometimes is with Thai, without Thai, how formal? It depends on your industry. So if you yourself don't wear Thai when going to an interview, don't have a tie on the photo. Um, and as the next bullet point says, you should be recognizable in real life. Don't overdo it with Photoshop and makeup. Um, here obviously the women err on um too much just don't this is about being authentic and it's better to have no photo than have a completely photoshopped photo you come i mean you go to an interview the interview comes to the conference room or uh, switches on the webcam and it's like this is not the person from the cv who is that who am i speaking to so no um and please do not cut photos out of your favorite party where oh but i like this photo and then you can see half a shoulder of somebody else or that it was taken out of a conference scenario just please don't do that okay and last but not least please proofread it um, if you have spent a lot of time with your CV, which the majority of you will do if you prepare it properly, 
your brain does not register mistakes. So give the CV to somebody else, ideally to somebody who has never before even seen your CV. However, if there is nobody you can trust um, or there is nobody in reach, here are a couple of proofreading tips. Instead of reading the CV from top to bottom, read it from bottom to top, from right to left, because your brain is then not used to the text and it has to interpret the data from scratch. So read it from bottom to top. Give it to somebody else. If you can, use spell check. It is there for a reason. And check and double check your margins, spaces, typos, dashes, consistencies in how you uh, write repetitive elements like position, company names, look at bullet points, the beginning and end of sentences, etc., etc. Good. Any last questions when it comes to CVs? Or are we ready? Okay, good, a very detailed question. What margin size should be used? Anywhere between one, the minimum of margins would be 1.25 centimeters to maximum, I'd say two or two and a half. That's the first time I get this question, thank you. <laughs> uh, font size, depending on the font type, if it's Arial, I'd say between 10 and 11. Okay, I think there's one more CV question coming up before we move to CV for applicant tracking systems. Is it, uh, oh, that's a good one, uh, GDPR. Um, thank you for pointing that out, GDPR. I will make sure this question is already on the slides uh, in um, our edition in Polish on Thursday. GDPR. Now, if you apply to a job ad and it says, please include that disclaimer, then definitely include it. From a, um, if you use exec, if you use executive search as a channel, or recruiter, recruitment agencies, or apply directly to the company, you have three choices. As a candidate, you do not have to, by law, include a disclaimer. So you can leave it blank. Option number two, you can add a generic disclaimer saying, um, I hereby agree to the processing of my personal data for current and future recruitment processes. Option number three is to actually say, I agree to the processing of my uh, personal data by and then add the company name. So it's dedicated, it's a dedicated disclaimer for that particular company that you're applying to, which means if you send your CV to 90 companies, you will have 90 CV versions. Uh, but by law, you don't even have to include it. Again, I'll repeat, if you apply to a job ad, you must include the disclaimer as is on, on the job ad. And I will make sure um, after the webinar to send you the information about GDPR and the batching and moving up within a company. Okay, CVs for applicant tracking systems start. What are applicant tracking systems and why are they used? Um, let's relatively quickly go through that. I just want to make sure we are on the same page if you don't, if you haven't heard about that yet. Applicant tracking system saves money and time, 30 to 50 hours on, instead of having a person going through CVs manually, it saves 30 to 50 hours. In the US, it prevents lawsuits. Um, and here we look at discrimination. Some AI tools have reported a 20 to 100% increase in gender, ethnic, and socioeconomic diversity of hires. And you have the source there if you want to read more about it. And obviously, you have everything in one place instead of having CVs and candidates on 10 different inboxes, uh, eight different desktops, different server folders, etc. You have everything in one place. 
Um, here we have some more data. 95% of large organizations use ATS as part of the recruitment process. Big companies receive about 50 to 75,000 resumes each week. Uh, one of those who receive them the most are, for example, companies like Amazon, Facebook, Google. What's most important here, 75% of resumes will never be seen by human eyes. And I will explain to you why and how to manage that. The ATS used by Fortune 500, Taleo 151, Workday 73, Sub Success Factor 60, et cetera, et cetera. Why is that important? Um, because there is a tool, a free tool with limitations, and I'll explain what the limitations are. Um, the tool that we recommend to use is JobScan, which is based, at least that's what they claim, on Taleo, which is the most widely used ATS within the big companies. So how do you know if your CV is being uploaded to a database and an applicant tracking system, look at the link. So here, for example, 3M uses Workday, uh, Coca-Cola uses Workday, uh, Nike uses Taleo, etc. So when you look at the link, you can see what applicant tracking system is being used. And if you, are, if you want to be particularly diligent, you can Google that applicant tracking system and look for applicant tracking specific advice as to how to optimize your CV. So how did we come up with how a CV for ATS should look like? And here, bear with me, I'll walk you through this whole, the whole um, table. So first of all, we, there are websites that we would call CV scanners. VMOC, Rescore, Resume Worded, Skill Roads, and Life Career. So we uploaded four different types of CVs into those CV scanners to see how they would be assessed. Now, what's important, and this I can't stress it enough, the tips of the, the types of advice that different pieces of advi advice that you will receive from those five different CV scanners contradict themselves very often. So don't say, oh, but VMOX said da 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 doesn't matter. So what we did, we chose a particular client CV. We uploaded the old CV, which would be the ugly before version that you saw within the 10 bad examples. So we uploaded the old CV and um, we uploaded the optimized CV that for a human being would have been absolutely great. Now see what happens. Applicant tracking systems don't necessarily prefer the optimized human version. Do you see that? So a version that we would have said, this is fantastic. The applicant tracking, the CV scanner said, no, no, we preferred the before version. Go figure. Um, then we also realized that with life career, it doesn't really matter what you do. You will always have eight to nine critical errors and um, it doesn't matter what you do. You will always be within the 26 to 29 percent who have scored higher. Why? They want to upsell their products. So don't go on life career. Um, we then started implementing um, all the feedback and then uploaded the optimized um, format. Plus, we didn't, um, we listened to job scan. Um, to job scan advice. And here we get pretty much same results. Um, in other words, and this is uh, something for you to know, what job scan recommends is good enough. 
it's you don't need to go through all of them especially when they contradict each other so for you not to have to go through all that what we just did um when you want to apply to a job but that is important to you use job scan on the left you paste your resume or upload it as a pdf or a document whatever you have and on the right you copy paste the job description of the job that you're applying to you click scan again this is based on the most used ats which is taleo and it will tell you how the applicant tracking system will interpret your cv against the job description now in our case with this um, experiment and the whole process that we did a human reader would have said not that the, the candidate is a 28 percent match they would have said this is a solid candidate for at least 80 percent but the eight atheists disagreed here also to show you so on the very left we have um a version that a human would have said ready to go good cv good candidate not good cv good candidate then we added and now look at the second cv we added the yellow bits the, those are eight lines and that same candidate is now a 52 percent match by adding five lines and the five lines are different contact details we added the, the section skills and um, we added keywords in one of the entries. Then we added the red bits, we listened to job scan and we added um, at the very end areas of expertise and competencies and three more words at the top. And all of a sudden, this is a 77% candidate match. And then we added the green bits and all of a sudden by adding approximately 12, 15 lines here and there without lying, we have gone from 26% to 85% match. And this is now a CV that a human recruiter would look at because the system said probably will match the job description. So what are the insights and how do you prepare a CV that matches ATS? It has to be chronological with skills and competencies section. The contact details might sound absurd, but the phone number should be written without spaces because otherwise the applicant tracking system might think it's a date and dates mean probably professional experience or education postal code city country, email address or links that are not active. ATS don't like active links. Format, PDF unless it asks for a doc version. No header or footer. No tables, text boxes, graphics, images or columns. Length, and here when you look at the, um, the CV scanners, Either they say it doesn't matter or they recommend maximum two pages. We would say it doesn't matter. The match is much more important. Fonts, traditional black bold is okay, but again, it's a software who reads it. So what does the software care? Bullets, only standard first level bullets. Second level bullets are not read by ATS. Language, standard active verbs, no filler words, 0% uh, zero percent mistakes there's no tolerance for mistakes because ATS don't understand mistakes make sure to have long and short descriptions of well here you see it with the examples of what I mean so if you have an MBA don't just say MBA but say master of business administration in parenthesis MBA because you don't know how the eight how the system was set up and if the keywords that um, the system looks for is MBA or Master of Business Administration. If you use M&A, which should be clear for a human, but still use mergers and acquisitions in parentheses M&A. If it is something that, if, it, if you apply to a concrete job ad, make sure you use the exact words from the job ad. So 
If the job it reads, responsible for recruiting, selecting, orienting, training, scheduling, and disciplining employees, don't write responsible for recruitment, selection, schedule creation, and disciplinary action of team members. This is not a match. It compares. So if it's recruiting, it will look for recruiting and not recruitment. Hope that makes sense. Insights for beating the system. Do not use white fonts. The ATS, and what I mean, and two years ago, if we had this webinar, we would have told you, oh, if you want to make sure the applicant tracking system sees you, at part of the job at, at the end of your CV in white font, blah, blah. The human will not know it. The applicant tracking system doesn't care. They have already programmed for that. So this trick won't work. Don't repeat keywords at the end. So some of them then say, okay, if marketing is important, uh, some candidates have come up with the idea that they just said marketing, 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 marketing. That won't work. Don't copy paste the job ad. What you can do and what does work, add keywords throughout the CV, add competency section at the end. Okay, and add the competency section at the end. Now, what happens, and we already talked about it, the a CV that is prepared for ATS will not be visually pleasing for the human. So if you have gone, if, the database, the ATS, the AI has recommended you further to the recruiter and the recruiter says, I would like to talk to you. You get an email, a phone call, something. What do you do then? You say, fantastic, please find attached my CV and you send the human CV. Make sense? I hope so. Good, at this point, any questions about ATS CVs? Because as you can see, I'm ready to move on to how to hack LinkedIn. Okay, a couple of people are asking questions. If you're live uh, watching, streaming on Facebook, if you have any questions about CVs for ATS, this is the moment to ask them. Uh, should we send two CVs by email? No, only one. In some portals, they... Uh, ask about filling some forms with details plus upload CV. Does ATS read the forms or CV? They will read both. Uh, Damien, here maybe a, a comment. Um, should we send two CVs by email? I wouldn't send it right away. If the recruiter, for example, if the channel is recruiter and the recruiter says, listen, thank you very much, we will upload your CV to the database, then you can say, okay, um, I have a version that will be easier to upload. And then you can, like as a, if you've received the signal from the recruiter that they will process your CV, you can say, hey, I have a second one, which is um, ATS compliant, for example. In that case, is it important to fill those forms if ATS is reading the CV. Um, well, here with the forms there are different types of forms because either um, you will receive either the form is pre-filled out with the CV that you upload and then you fill out the missing bits or it is completely um, uh, not linked and then definitely fill out the forms because there is information that additionally helps you um, how you are categorized in the database of CVs, uh, of candidates. Um, Ivan, will it be possible to get this presentation? No, but um, for those who have uh, joined a bit later, we will not share the presentation, make notes. Having said that, Everyone who was present today will receive our step-by-step -step guide on how to prepare CVs for ATS. So it will take you through that step-by-step. -step. What if job ads in local language and CV send in English required? Um, here, Richard, it depends on the applicant tracking system, how it is set up. Um, 
the ATSs in English work the best because it is the easiest language. It doesn't have declinations. Polish and Polish has a lot of decline, declinations. So it is used to track applicants, but the scanning doesn't always work. And this is something, um, for example, the Polish softwares are still working on. So here very often it helps in tracking applicants in general of who is in what recruitment process, but not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily match candidates against job ads. How good does jobs can work in English and German? It doesn't work at all. It only works in English. Um, and one thing, um, thanks for asking again about job scan. Important to know, you get five free job scans per month, which means if you want to play with it and see how it works, you would actually already lose one free scan. And um, then if you have a couple of, uh, um, applications that are important to you will actually have to pay job scan to get more scans. Can we have examples on ATS format CVs? No, you will not get um, the, the formats. You will get the actual guide that gets you through with a checklist. Um, so it's even better than the examples. You get the actual checklist and the step-by-step -step how to do that and how to optimize your CV for the job ads. So you will get that. Okay, good. Let's move on. How to hack LinkedIn when looking for a job. Hold on. Good. Um, from a headhunter's or recruiter's perspective, um, before LinkedIn um, or before LinkedIn becomes so popular, that, that's how I should phrase it, um, where did uh, recruiters and headhunters um, get candidates from database, own network, recommendations, LinkedIn, Golden Link, Sync, Twitter, and industry events, for example. Now, looking at it, and all these sources have very often been substituted by LinkedIn. Um, there are recruitment companies, including executive search firms, that when receiving an unsolicited CVs, they will actually reply to you and say, listen, thank you very much for your CV. Because of GDPR, we have stopped having a database of CVs. So please find us on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is our database. Um, almost everyone is on LinkedIn. So very often, this is where recruiters search through their own network. Um, recommendations, you can again ask via LinkedIn. Um, out of those four, LinkedIn is the most common one. Having said that, if you're in the German speaking market, you definitely also need the Xing profile. And well, you still go to the events. Having said that, there's lots happening online instead of offline. But once this is over, we'll go back to meeting candidates at industry events. So how does that work? Simplified. And here my recommendation, put yourself into the shoes of a recruiter, hiring manager, researcher, anybody who's looking for candidates. And think of what filters do they need to use on LinkedIn to find me, me as a candidate. So research do the research actually on LinkedIn. Here we have, um, as an example, somebody looking for a finance director in Berlin. 6,000 candidates would potentially fall into that category. Meaning, if you want to stand out, or if you even want to be taken into consideration, you need to make sure that you are at the top of those 6,000 um, search results. Or, um, because nobody will go through 6,000 results. You need to make sure to define which filter somebody needs to click to find you, which keywords to use. Um, and again, one thing you also need to remember, there are different, uh, different companies 
describe positions differently. Sometimes it's finance director, some say CFO. So if you could have two different labels, make sure that those are included in your profile. Not right away in the tagline, but it can be part of the profile summary. Okay, the filters, the simple filters. And the reason why I'm showing you the simple filters is because um, LinkedIn recruiter, uh, corporate recruiter and recruiter light are very expensive um, tools. So more often than not, recruiters still rely on the basic filters. Almost everybody has access to at least with a basic premium uh, account. So you need to think about um, is it location that you want to be in a certain location, you want to be found in, in a certain industry, you want to be found in profile language, uh, maybe it's education, uh, maybe certain services, contact interest, et cetera, et cetera. So define that. So how that works, filters are to narrow down the candidate pool, especially if it's more than a thousand. And again, the thinking here is why should I click on or through 1000 profiles and contact all of them if when going through the first 50, I already have a couple of good and potentially competent candidates. So as with the Google search results, I mean, who goes on page 10 of the Google search result? This is like deep internet. Um, you want to be in the front. I just said that first pages of the search results are important. What is visible next to the results um, is the photo and tagline. And this very often decides about whether somebody clicks on you or not. So photo and tagline on LinkedIn are super, super crucial. Um, if the profile doesn't have a lot of information, so it's very frugal, that's not good because it raises too many question marks. Meaning if I have 200 candidates where 10 or 20 candidates don't share anything about themselves and I have to follow up and I need to contact them and I need to ask for the CV, I'll go with the easy candidates, especially nowadays that we have an employer market and, um, employers can really cherry pick the candidates here and there and researchers or uh, recruitment consultants who source their own candidates sometimes have to ask for hundreds of cvs i'm sure some of you have experienced um, the frustration of being asked for a cv you send it and you never hear back from them it's because of the volume of candidates uh, Elena will get to taglines in a bit. At least I hope. If not, then remind me. If there is too much detail, um, too many details on your CV, on the other hand, so we are now at the other extreme, the recruiter has no need to contact you because everything's there. So do not copy paste your CV. Make sure there is enough information for them to see could potential fit. I need, I need the CV. So balance is important. Now, right now, when looking at LinkedIn, we have, when filling out the LinkedIn prof profile, when optimizing the LinkedIn profile, you need to remember you have two different target groups. One is the human, the headhunter, the decision maker, the hiring manager, et cetera. And the other target group is the LinkedIn algorithm that likes keywords. Um, and here again, the person, who filters out the candidates, looks for reasons to exclude the candidates from the recruitment process. Typos, photos, quality of the profile are all reasons to exclude candidates. Um, right now, the recruiter light costs about 120 um, US dollars per month, which is expensive if you have, especially if it's a small company, it's then easily five, six, seven hundred um, dollars only, like so that every recruiter or every researcher has their own uh, account, which then means that very often either they do not have an account, which means that you need to make sure to be 
visible within the search results, meaning you need to have a lot of con a big network. So you're on the second or third level uh, connection in the search results. Or um, one other thing this is solved that companies, especially the small ones, buy one paid account per company that is used by everyone. And if you have done a little bit of messaging on LinkedIn, especially in the inbox, it's not very user-friendly. You can see the sent messages as part of the inbox. And it's very often you can miss um, and now imagine if you as one person can miss a reply, then imagine five people working on one account. So if you don't reply quickly and somebody doesn't see your response right away, you might then be in response number 70 something and blah, blah, blah. Um, therefore, a good optimized profile is the key to success. Um, you need to define under which criteria you want to be found. You need to make sure that the keywords are there in the whole profile and the profile needs to be correct. What does that mean? Here's a real example. And um, we usually take either real example based on volunteers or I now we randomly selected somebody from the United States. So here the majority is from Europe. I don't know this person. It's public information from LinkedIn. So um, let's quickly go through what it means to have a correct profile. The first thing is the link. You want to make sure that you, the link to your LinkedIn profile is personalized. Uh, you do that in the profile settings, click on uh, personalize your URL, and that's how you do that. Then this is the tagline, and I think it was Elena asking about the tagline. So when you have the search results, you see the name and then the tagline. This is uh, Director of Finance at AT Kearney. This would be an automatic tagline, which you can personalize and change. So let's say you could change that to Finance Director slash Change Management or Digitalization or consulting industry or simply leave it as a uh, finance director slash CFO, for example. Um, maybe one more thing to the tagline, the tagline that doesn't work at all is if you say I'm looking for a new job, that doesn't work. Then we have the area and the number of connections that are visible. Anybody actively looking for a job should have at least the like the 500 plus connections ideally with people who are themselves well connected so feel free to all add me to your linkedin profiles if that helps you uh if that helps you be visible in recruiters research etc find me linkedin connect with me i'll happily add you and help you in your job search um so anything here is a question what about saying that you are available in the tagline anything that hints at potentially desperate job seeker will not work the way you communicate that you're looking for a job i'll show you in one of the next slides then you have the background photo if it's not part of your branding strategy to i don't know you on the stage as a speaker or something, please don't add personal photos, sunsets. For some reasons, leaves are very popular on LinkedIn. Uh, quotes, Albert Einstein, no, keep it professional. Uh, then we have the profile summary. As you can see here, international finance executive, build relationships, this is absolutely generic. Your profile summary on the CV will have a higher level of detail. The profile summary on LinkedIn will not disclose that level of detail in terms of the budgets or percentages, etc. Unless you keep it vague or yeah. Then accomplish for some reason LinkedIn um, says that uh, knowing languages is an accomplishment. Well. It is a US portal, so for them it is 
an accomplishment to know another language English does this mean. Um, here, one thing um, that is a very common mistake, don't assume that everybody knows your own native language, the one that you are proficient in. So make sure, double check your profiles and make sure you have all your language skills there. <clears throat> and profile summary, the best structure for a profile summary on LinkedIn is the following. First, have a unique profile summary for the human being, and then add for the algorithm areas and skills, colon, finance, strategy, forecasting, budgeting, accounting, controlling, etc. So here we cater to two different target groups, to the human and to the bot. And this is now where you show uh, the right target group that you are looking. In the privacy settings, you have job seeking preferences and make sure to fill out everything. Everything you can fill out, please fill it out. This is where you do that. Um, and you can see in the bottom uh, top left, it's uh, linkedin.com slash P settings. And this is how you get there. Or you simply go through your profile. Then how do you find non-obvious job ads? That's especially interesting to those who are actively looking for a job already. Not all job ads are in all the locations posted because again, LinkedIn is expensive. Um, here an example, For here we have head of risk and controls, Bangkok based, but was um, published in Munich or head of SDR slash BDR based in either Paris, Madrid, or Milan, but it was published in Paris. So that's why we call them non-obvious ads because somebody who's looking for a job in Madrid or in Milan doesn't think of looking through job ads in Paris. Now we do that research for you. It takes us half a day each week to source obvious and non-obvious job ads. I highly recommend you add yourselves to the group Hidden Job Market for Experienced Managers in Europe, where every Monday we publish curated job ads. We also add job ads that are not published, that we get through our own channels, that we get through headhunters and um, from companies directly. Now, how do you optimize your LinkedIn profile for job ads? We have four different types of job ads and bear with me and focus for a bit. The first type is, do we see skills posted by the job poster? And do we have more than, kin, more than 10 applicants with a premium account? So here you can see, the assumption is for you to have a premium account. If you don't have one, active, activate one for free for one month and do the research. So you will have in total four different combinations. So no skills by job poster and less than 10 candidates, no job skills by poster and more than 10 candidates, skills by job poster and less than 10 candidates and skills by job poster, but more and more than 10 candidates. Um, the fourth option is obviously the best. How does it look like in practice? So this is an example of number two. The job poster did not add skills, but there are more than 10 applicants, in this case, 101 applicants. And if you have a premium account, you get to see competitive intelligence about our applicants. How do you um compared to others and you take those skills and here you have an example of four the ideal version where at the beginning you have skills plus you have the top skills down there so you go through about five to ten job ads um, that are obviously similar you copy paste those um those skills onto your linkedin profile apologies you add them to your LinkedIn, uh, you first analyze them, you sort them and use the ones that have been mentioned most often, you add them to your LinkedIn profile. 
So when you click apply, the LinkedIn algorithm automatically recognizes if you are potentially a top candidate or not. Wait, wrong direction. So most important tips, profile summary, first the human, then the bot, sprinkle keywords across the profile on LinkedIn. Uh, Isabella, it's not about how many skills are too much. Uh, it's about the system restriction of, I want to say 50 or 150 skills. And I now have a brain freeze. I don't remember if it was 50 or 150. So it's not about um, the quantity, it's 50. Okay, thank you, Diana. Uh, so 50 is the maximum, just use all 50. Um, research the job ads, add the skills and ideally get them endorsed. Um, and before we have, and I'll stay an extra 10, 15 minutes before we start the Q and A. Um, if you think that those webinars are useful and can help other people who have lost their jobs or will most probably soon lose their jobs, help us spread the word, um, help us help more people. In the meantime, if you want to keep up with what's going on in the job market, you can um, follow Career Angels on LinkedIn. We are now up posting updates almost every day, sometimes twice, to inform you on what's going on. We do also have a blog. Um, if you're not familiar with that one yet, definitely go through the guides on how to navigate the whole job search during um, coronavirus times. You can also go on our website. We have a section called free materials where you can find things as precise as how do I find email addresses of decision makers, step-by-step -step guides. And if you think that this is valuable and if you want to help us help others, you can also donate to PayPal. As I said, the amount, if it's even two euros, it's more than zero euro. If it's more than that, we'll be happy to um, to receive or to crowdfund uh, from any amount. Um, the big companies, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the big outplacement companies that do have the budgets, that do have the resources, they are not doing anything like it. Um, we decided to step up as a very small boutique career consulting um, company so if you want to support us in supporting others thank you very much in advance and now let's say 10 minutes for q a um, one question is already there how do you get specific skills endorsed you need to well one of the ways to do that is find people who are also looking for a job and ask each other to endorse each other's skills. And now having said that, um, I was already thinking about starting a LinkedIn group for participants of those webinars. So if you are interested in that, um, because of course those who are participating here, you don't know each other, but um, we could set up a group on LinkedIn um, so you can help each other, for example, with the skills endorsement, if that's interesting for you. Um, at this point, I also want to thank Marcelina, who is the one managing the email uh, address webinar at careerangels.eu. Um, and she'll make sure um, to send you the materials that I've promised during today's webinar. And um, I'll make sure she reaches out to you and invites you to that group of participants of our webinar so we can help each other, you can help each other for example, in endorsing specific skills, because that is the question, and uh, Sandra's question is a good question, how do you endorse specific skills? Because you don't want random skills, sometimes you already have skills in the profile that shouldn't be endorsed, but because of how the, um, of how the algorithm works, it suggests two other users to endorse skills that maybe not that important to you so that's actually a good question Sandra thank you uh, um, okay one more comment thank you Sandra and career and just team fantastic webinar glad you liked it 
question, does it make a difference how many endorsements do you have for a particular skill? Dorota, um, probably yes. Um, when it comes to candidate ranking on job ads. So if you apply to job ads where there are a lot of other candidates and a lot, not 20, but two, three, four, five hundred, then it definitely will make a difference on how you are then uh, ranked. But if you apply to job ads where there are never more than 20 or 40 candidates, this is enough candidates for a recruiter to actually flip through, um, flip through the profiles. Okay, there are some more. Thank you for tips and your time. You're very welcome. We have seven more minutes for Q&A. So let's see if you have more questions. Okay, this is a long question. When sending speculative application to HR or hiring manager, how should the email look like? Um, thank you for the question. I will answer that next week on Tuesday where we will discuss in detail how to contact um, decision makers, how the email should look like, what attachments to add. Uh, one of the things we will also explain next week why it doesn't make sense to send your speculative applications to HR unless you work in HR. So you'll have to bear with me on that one and we'll explain it in detail next week. Okay, next question. What to do with a short experience three to six months a few years ago? Keep it on the CV, remove it. Is there any good templates for CVs that you can recommend? Um, we don't recommend any type of templates. We don't work off templates. We don't like templates. We prefer to prepare every single CV from scratch. Um, so it fits the target market, it fits your personality, it fits your profession, it needs to fit. Um, now, when it comes to the gaps, if you can remove the month and that gap then disappears, then delete it from the CV. Uh, Robert asked, is premium must on LinkedIn? No, it's not. Um, the premium account helps you to research um, the job ads for the skills. So either you activate the premium account for free for a month if LinkedIn allows for the adoption. Otherwise, ask somebody who does have a premium account to simply do the research from there while logged onto their account. Uh, and premium gives you access um, to uh, LinkedIn learning. So if there's something, if you want to improve your competencies, then it makes sense, but it's definitely not a must. We have not seen a difference in premium and non-premium in terms of how it then influences the job search. Uh, please recommend a reliable source of data about salaries, positions, countries. On top of my head, I can recommend salary service by Hayes, um, salary, servi salary service by Robert Half. Uh, that's on top of my head. Uh, Diana, EU, okay, that's it. Is it okay to use the profile from CV in the LinkedIn profile? Overall, yes, unless the profile in the CV is too specific. So then you um, make it less specific. Plus on LinkedIn, as I showed you, you need to add um, for the bots the information of key skills and then have a list of key skills. So usually you use probably 90% of the profile from the CV in your LinkedIn profile, plus you add a section that you would not have on the CV, at least not uh, the human version. Next question, if your last position was December 2019, do you need to judge the gap in your CV? No, you don't have to do that. Next question, how about blue steps? We have run a couple of trials experiments with our senior executive clients on blue steps so far i have not seen one single candidate get contacted via blue step so i don't see how it makes sense to pay for that account plus everybody is on linkedin anyway so i'd say if you have a choice uh then go um linkedin is enough and or maybe upgrade um 
your basic LinkedIn account to a premium LinkedIn account, but Blue Steps is not necessary. Sell reports, yes, thank you for sharing that. Antel has good sell reports and Michael Page as well. I forgot about Michael Page when it comes to Euro European Union. Good. Two last minutes. I'm so happy that uh, we started with 42 people at the very beginning and we are only down to 36 in the extended, um, in the extended uh, time. If there are any questions from Facebook, no questions on our live stream. Okay, I see two more people. Okay, now the thank yous are pouring in. I'm very happy to be reading, thank yous. <laughs> So summarizing, if there are no more questions, um, I'll be sending um, uh, to you, and by me, I mean Marcelina, she'll be sending to you the information of G GDPR um, on the CVs, how to batch and show promotions in the documents, and the guide to the applicant tracking systems. Anybody who we are in touch with by email will, re will receive um, materials to prepare for the next webinar. Um, and if you want to extend your reach on LinkedIn, you feel free to invite me to your contacts if we aren't connected yet. Um, yeah, and I think that's about it as we don't have more questions. Uh, so thank you very much for joining today and I'll see you next week. And next week we'll talk about how to get in touch with decision makers, how to prepare a list of companies, how to get in touch with decision makers, how to reach out to them, what email to write to them for it to work, what KPIs you can expect, response rate, interview rates, etc. etc. So thank you very much and have a good day. Bye.